Uh, first off, I'd like to um, um, introduce myself. My name's uh, David Yang. I'm a mathematics instructor at Fresno City College. Uh, for those that don't know who I am, uh, I'll be moderating today's uh, discussion panel. And again, uh, thank you all for joining us um, on this uh, panel discussion as part of the Asian American Month celebration here at Fresno City College. Um, and during this panel, we'll be learning about the journey and experiences of a few of our Asian American uh, employees at the uh, State Center Community College District. <clears throat> In addition, um, we'll get to learn a little bit about the different types of leadership and faculty uh, positions in academia, the, their unique responsibilities, and then delve in on the importance of representation of Asian Pacific Islander Americans in academia. Um, in regards to representation, specifically here at uh, State Center Community College, um, we have uh, well, less than 4% of Asian uh, Pacific Islander uh, and American faculty, staff, and administrators, while our student population makes up about 11% uh, of the population. So, um, so we kind of want to, you know, balance that out so that the the uh, faculty representation is mirroring our student population, right? And so that's one of the things that we'll kind of get into today as well. Um, so with us today, you guys see on our screen, we have uh, Deborah Akeda, Lee Herrick, uh, Kuvu, and Joseph Lin. Uh, so let me go into a little bit on um, each of the uh, of our panelists. Um, um, before we start with the questions. So Deborah Akeda, uh, she currently serves as the board of trustees uh, on the board of trustees for the State Center Community College District. Uh, she's been board president and vice president during her five years on the board. Um, in terms of her role in, uh, in our district, she also is a retired president of the Clovis Community College and um, she, had certain, she has served multiple roles at Fresno City College as well, including interim vice president of instruction. Uh, and Deborah uh, was really instrumental in leading the way for the Clovis Community College uh, to become a independently accredited college, uh, making it the third uh, independent college in our district. Um, in addition to her work in with our with our college and our district, uh, Deborah has committed a lot of her time to serving on various boards throughout the uh, community and has received many, many awards for her contributions as well. Uh, thank you, Deborah, for joining us. Lee Herrick, uh, Lee began teaching at Fresno City College in 1997. Um, and his accomplishments uh, at the college include receiving the Bill F. Stewart Award for um, Excellence in Education. And he's currently working towards establishing the Social Justice Cultural Center here at Fresno City College. Uh, Lee has served as the Fresno Poet Laureate uh, from 2015 to 2017. And along with his work serving our community and our campus, Lee has, actually, Lee has also authored uh, three, po three poem books and has many of his poems appeared in textbooks and anthologies. Welcome, Lee. Uh, Ku Vu teaches uh, political science uh, at Fresno City College and is the faculty champion for the Law Pathways program from Fresno, yeah, Fresno City College. You see her background there. <laughs> and uh, in her and Ku's interest, uh, research interest lies in American politics particularly in the areas of subnational politics, representation, and political participation. Um, and then welcome, Ku. And lastly, but not least, we have Joseph Lin. Joseph Lin is a current science department chair at Reedley College. And in addition to teaching, Reedley, uh, teaching biology at Reedley, Joseph also teaches at Fresno State as an adjunct uh, lecturer. Uh, Joseph is actually actively engaged in several committees and task force at his college. Um, and with a passion for science education, Joseph is actually working towards his doctorate in educational literature with a focus on STEM education. Uh, Joseph's thesis research will examine um, the online engagement and delivery of biology courses. Perfect for our time right now, right, Joseph? <laughs> All right, welcome, Joseph. Um, so um, as we get to our, our as our we get to our Q and A session with the panelists, um, again, I want to remind you that. Um, um, to our attendees that if you have any questions, please post those in the Q&A uh, tab. Um, you can see that at the bottom of the chat is actually disabled. Um, so please use the Q&A uh, tab and then we'll do our best to try to uh, get to the answers. Um, our, our, um, our attendees will be uh, viewing, or sorry, not attendees, our panelists will be, will be viewing the, the Q&A tab along with myself. So if there's any questions that uh, can't be answered, um, through te uh, through the um, Q and A session, and that would be uh, applicable to 
bring it up during our session here, then we'll bring that up as well. All right. So, um, so again, you know, um, thank you to our panelists for uh, coming on uh, and joining us today and sharing with us our experiences. So, uh, in terms of experiences, we'll start with the first question. Uh, the first question is, uh, again, all of these questions will be directed to all four of our panelists. And so um, as we go through, we'll, we'll go in the order, we'll go Deborah and then Lee and then uh, Ku and Joseph. We'll just continue in that order um, um, through all of these questions. So uh, once once each one of you is finished then the next one can uh, proceed. Um, and um, there may be, uh, as you guys are, as you guys are sharing your expenses, if there's any like Follow up questions um, that I may have, or even if our panelists, you know, feels that you know you want to contribute to um, uh, or to the discussion, feel free to to chime in as well. Okay, so the first question, and again, we'll start with Deborah first. Is uh, can you please share with us your journey um, in the uh, State Center Community College District and how ha how it has shaped you to be where you are today? Oh, Deborah, you're still muted. I think I do this often enough now that I right. remember yeah. unmute. <laughs> um, just a little bit about my background. Uh, I actually grew up in Chicago, and my father owned a small wire products factory there on the south side of Chicago, and his company made these metal display racks uh, that. Uh, and they held things such as greeting cards, tools, or candy. You know, they kind of spin around. I think you've seen those at grocery stores. His business was so small that my two brothers, uh, my sister, and myself, would go to the factory on weekends, and we were our own little work crew. And we mostly packed racks in the boxes for shipping to customers. And when we were really small, uh, we'd put four rubber tips in a bag and staple it together. And those tips would go on the bottom of the rack so they didn't scratch the floor. So we were pretty young. My youngest brother was so young, he didn't even know what four was. So we lined up four tips on the table and says, match that. Um, but I really learned how to work at the factory. Uh, I remember working early on and uh, we worked really hard so that we would finish a task. And we started running around all the boxes of all the unmade boxes because we had finished our job and my father came up to us and said well what do you think you're doing we said well we're playing he said no 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 you don't do that when you finish a job you come back to me and ask what else needs to be done and at the time we thought he was crazy because we had worked so hard so that we could play and uh and he said what do you mean ask what else needs to be done but that lesson really stuck with me and uh, so I really learned how to work hard uh, by working at my uh, father's factory. I attended the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana and earned a BS in elementary education. And at the same time, uh, I was on a scholarship and I finished enough units so that I was able to take uh, several, my last semester, I was able to start my doctor, my um, master's degree program in counseling site because I knew that's what I eventually wanted to do. But after I finished my bachelor's degree, I went to the uh, I went and got a job with Chicago Public Schools. And at the first year, they started me as a kindergarten teacher and a reading teacher. And the second year, they made me the eighth grade science teacher. But after two years, I planned to return to the university for my master's degree in counseling psych, and I did. And I finished that after I completed my master's degree there. I went back to Chicago to apply for jobs. Now at the time, this is before desktop computers were everywhere. So I actually visited all the six Chicago, I'm pretty old folks. I visited all the six Chicago City Colleges in person and I went to the mail rooms. You couldn't do that now. And I put my resume in mailboxes that looked like administrator mailboxes. And by golly, the very next day, I got a call asking me if I could come in for an interview that day. Uh, and so I did, I went to Loop City College, which is now called Harold Washington College. Uh, and he, uh, that college is now named after the first African-American mayor of the city of Chicago. But after the interview, they actually offered me the job on the spot uh, for a grant funded program. And when I asked when they wanted me to start, they said, well, can you start tomorrow? That just does not happen. But I was brand new and I thought, well, that must be high how people get hired in community colleges is pretty different from K-12. 
I, I came to learn later that really wasn't the case. But after two years, I became the director of that program. Uh, and then I became an assistant dean of academic support services, which included the admissions and records office, the tutorial center, and the special program that I was involved with. I wanted to move to California, though, as my parents were originally from the LA area, and I visited there, and Chicago was just really cold. So I remember walking to the L one day, which is sort of like the BART, except underground in Chicago. And I looked over to the side and the IBM building was there and they had ropes strung along the sidewalk because it was so cold, the, the ice on the sidewalk had frozen up again and people were holding onto the ropes so they wouldn't get blown over by the wind. And I distinctly remember thinking, I've got to get out of this place. So I applied to community colleges in California and um, I got Bakersfield College was one, Fresno City College was another and Fresno City called first and asked me if I wanted to come to interview and Bakersfield had called after that but I had already uh, committed to interviewing at Fresno City. So uh, I told my parents, well, I, I got this interview at Fresno City College and they, now you have to remember they're both from LA and they had only been through Fresno maybe once going to Yosemite National Park, probably in the 1930s, right? So think of Fresno in 1930. And they both said at once, Fresno, they don't even have paved streets in Fresno. And I'm now this is 1980, 81. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to a place that doesn't have paved streets. So when I flew in for the interview, I'm looking out the plane window and I see paved streets all over. So I go to the hotel, I call home, and I said, you know, they have paved streets all over here. It's a beautiful city. And they both started laughing because they thought, oh, oh, well, we're thinking of Fresno probably 30, 40 years ago. Anyway, I really should have been born in California, but both my parents were uh, put into a, a, the Manzanar concentration camp during World War II uh, just because they were Japanese American. And I, I know many of you know what those, those camps were. And they, they were there for two or three years um, before they left to go to Chicago. So my father actually joined the US military intelligence service out of Chicago. So after the war, he went back to Chicago and that's how I ended up being born in Chicago rather than LA. So I was always meant to come back to California. Anyway, back in 1981, um, Robert Fox, who was the first African-American Dean of Students uh, hired me sight unseen. He he called me on the phone to interview me. I had I was expecting the same kind of interview I had at Loop City College, which was you know with one or two people and they offer you the job the next day. No, not at Fresno City. There was a president's conference room. There were probably twelve people around that table, and they asked all these questions. And uh, I get, made it to the top three. And Robert Fox, who is the uh, vice president of student services. Um, called me on the phone in, in about a week or so and interviewed me over the phone. So he, he never met me. And in a, another week, he offered me the job and he asked me to go meet the president of the college at O'Hare Airport because he was flying through at the time. And at that time, you could go right to the gate. So I go to the gate to meet Dr. McCulley and I'm looking for a guy in a suit. And out comes a guy in a Hawaiian shirt and shorts and he introduced himself as the president. I'm in a suit, of course. And I thought, wow, Fresno City is pretty relaxed. Anyway, I got the job at Fresno City College and I started off as a Dean of Counseling Services and I was there for about 20 years. And during that time, I had the opportunity to work with the Dean of the Humanities Division and together we started the Puente Program, the Ideally Program and the UCL Program and hired the faculty who, who actually ran the program. We just found the money to do it and got the approval from the administration to do it. And really the people who ran the program were the English instructors and the uh, counselor. And, and Lee Herrick was one of those. I served in that capacity until, until, um, by, until Ned Daphne, who was president of Fresno City College, suggested I apply for the vice, interim vice president of instruction at Fresno City. So I did that. And after I did that, uh, I applied to be the Vice President of Instruction Student Services at the North Centers, which included Clovis, Madera, and Oakhurst. I did that for seven years, applied to become the founding president of Clovis Community College, and uh, did that until I retired and immediately ran for the board, and I've been doing that ever since. So that's kind of a, my history is a little longer than other folks because I was in the district for 40 plus years. So I'll stop there. So Deborah, I do have um, one follow-up question for you because I know that 
you know, um, you've, you've taken on a lot of leadership roles in our district. Um, and I just wanted to know, like, what motivated you to take on these roles, particularly like, uh, in particular, like the servant on the board, right? Because I know you, that's like a, a position you have to be elected to. So like, what motivated you to take on these roles? To be honest, uh, I ran for the board because as I was taking Clovis Community College through the process to become accredited, uh, the board almost sunk our chances. What happened was uh, the board had received uh, a recommendation from previous visitors saying they needed to um, stop micromanaging and, uh, and delegate authority to the chancellor. And so when we were going through our final interviews to get accredited uh, and the interview team met with the board and they asked the board members, how have you improved in this area? The board member representing my area set, brought in a stack of paper about 12 inches high saying, well, I, I didn't have to change my ways or learn anything because your recommendation was wrong. We don't micromanage. And he proceeded in the next half hour to tell them why they don't micromanage. And another board member said something else. Well, he actually used bad language and, and said, I don't need you telling me how to be a board member. He got up and he walked out. And I thought, you know what? We have the board member representing my area for 30 some odd years. He's not gonna change. The only way to fix this problem is to get rid of him. And so I decided I needed to run for the board to try to bring um, to the board what I know to be the board member's role, which is to stay at the policy level and not micromanage. And I really make every effort to do that and let the college presidents and the chancellor run the district and really stay at the policy level. And I've made it a point not to interfere with the running of the colleges because that's not our role. And that's definitely not my role anymore. And I'm too far removed to even you know, know what's going on day to day at the college. So even when it comes to the budget, you know, we're really, policy oversight. We shouldn't be telling the colleges how the budget should be set up, but we're really there to, one of the things I want to do is to advance the issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's now been a call for action at the chancellor's office. I'm, I serve on the trustees uh, committees to try to make sure that happens. And one of the things we're looking at doing is changing the screening process for hiring faculty and administrators by ensuring that uh, the hiring committees or screening committees include diverse faculties and staff, and that they include students some way or other, whether it's having the students involved in the um, interview process by watching the teaching demonstrations of the faculty and then providing feedback to the faculty screening committee on what they thought, because we really want to know how students feel the faculty are doing, not just how the faculty experts know they're, how they're doing. Anyway, so that, that's really what I see my role as now um, in the district. Thank you, Deborah. So Lee, same question to you. Uh, I'll repeat it again. So um, can you please share us with your journey in uh, the State Center Community College District and how it has shaped you to be uh, where you are today? Uh, sure. Um, well, before I speak to that, I just wanted to uh, thank folks for being here and, and thank you, David, for moderating and to Susie and the interpreter and uh, especially Chai Her for organizing this, this panel. I'm, I'm happy to be here with, with Joseph and Koo, but especially Debbie, who I don't see as often as I would like, but uh, it was wonderful to hear her talk about her journey. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about her and the UCI program uh, in a minute. But basically I was, um, I had never been to Fresno. Actually, that's not correct. I was, I was only in Fresno once before I took the job here. Um, starting from the beginning, um, I was born in South Korea um, in Daejeon and adopted when I was 10 months old. So I'm Korean. Um, I was raised in the East Bay area in uh, Danville in California. And then um, my parents and my sister who are all white, uh, we moved to Modesto um, in the late seventies. My dad was in finance. So he got transferred to a new bank. So, um, you know, fast forward through high school, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do after high school, except I knew I wanted to go to college, but 
um, at that time, soccer was really my life and my focus. So I just wanted to play soccer wherever I could. But I was also very, um, let's just say I was very energetic and maybe not the best student at times. And I didn't have a lot of direction. So um, I had the great fortune of going to Modesto JC. Uh, I think my life was changed. I know my life was changed as a community college student at Modesto JC. I was allowed to uh, flounder, fail, find myself, and really have some of the best professors I've ever had in my life. And uh, so from there, I went to Stanislaus State uh, in Turlock, um, kept playing soccer, but also at that time really started to fall more in love with English. Uh, I had declared as an English major at that time, uh, had some incredible professors, and I, and I also started to get a little bit more serious about poetry at that time. Um, my master's degree was from Stanislaus State also, and that was in um, composition and rhetoric. So I studied classical rhetoricians like Aristotle and Cicero and studied um, elements of political persuasion and political rhetoric. So uh, by the time I had finished my master's degree, uh, I knew I wanted to teach at a two-year college. Um, I, I knew by then, after having worked as a tutor and thinking about my experience as a student and knowing I wanted to teach, I, I knew I wanted to teach at a, a large, diverse college. And so I applied my first year out, I applied to about 15 different colleges in California and I got very quick rejection letters from some as is the way it goes. Um, I interviewed at about eight of the colleges and I was a finalist at, at five of them. And I had two offers ultimately. And one of them, thank goodness, was from Fresno City College. I, I declined another job offer in Orange County. My plan was, you know, if I didn't get a job or if I didn't get any interviews in California my first year, or maybe even in my second year, my plan was to then apply around the country. Um, and and some, at that time, I was in the position to be able to do that. And maybe I'll speak to that later in the, the panel about just some thoughts for folks who might be in that position to consider your options and to not limit yourself, if that's possible. I know sometimes uh, there are good reasons why a person wants and needs to uh, remain local. But to Debbie's point about coming from Chicago, I, you know, I can't imagine my life if I had never uh, been offered a job here and, and accepted it and spent the last almost 25 years now. This is, I was hired in 1997 at Fresno City College. So I'm coming up on 25 years teaching here. Um, and it's been uh, one of the great blessings of my life, to be honest. You know, when I was Hired here, uh, 1997. It was a very different place and a, di a different time. Um, most many faculty didn't even use college email addresses at that time. I remember specifically a, a colleague in the department saying, "Oh, I just use Hotmail," and I said, "Oh, I know about Hotmail, but do you have a work email?" And she said, oh, "I don't really use that." Um, you know, there was no full-time Asian American studies instructor position which I, along with some others, worked very hard to get established. Um, you know, there was also no UCR program. And, and Debbie, I've always, um, I, don't think, I don't know if I've ever told you this in person, Debbie. I don't know if this counts, but sort of a hero of mine. You know, Debbie was instrumental at Fresno City College um, in many ways, but specific to this panel, she, along with Tony Cantu, who she mentioned, um, our late former president, and he was the division dean of the humanities division when I was hired, uh, they really got the money and put faculty in position to create the UCR program, which is a, a one-year academic program devoted to increasing the number of Southeast Asian American students who transfer to universities. And, you know, personally and professionally and just in, in every way, I've said this many times, the UCL program is probably one of the best, if not the most meaningful uh, professional experiences of my life. So, you know, also John Cho, who has been instrumental in so many ways at the college, 
John and I co-founded the Asian American Faculty and Staff Association. And that was probably sometime around 2000. Uh, I've been a department chair twice. Um, had the good fortune to be involved in a, in a number of different um, efforts and, and programs and, and things like that at the college. And uh, just to, to finish for now, what I'll say is um, two things. One is um, currently, and really for about the last four years, I've been working with and, and founded a group to establish the Social Justice and Cultural Center at our college, which I hope people are starting to hear about if they haven't already. Uh, Dr. Goldsmith announced a couple of convocations ago that we have a location and we're moving forward with next steps for planning to open. And, and I'm thrilled about that. And that couldn't happen without the hard work and, and commitment to some, some amazing faculty colleagues and staff colleagues committed to um, not just diversity, but also justice. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say just in, um, is that I really, uh, and this is probably a cliche, but time and time again, you know, when I was starting, when I had never been to Fresno City College, uh, mid-career, 10 or 15 years in, and even now, I'm, this, I'm now the senior faculty person in the English department. But before the people started to retire that I, came on with, I'd ask them, you know, what is it that keeps you going? And almost to the letter, they would all say the students. And that's what I would say. We've got the most remarkable, hardworking, perseverant, um, incredible students. Uh, and so that's really been, um, I think, the greatest part of the job. So that's a bit of my journey. Hey, thank you, Lee, uh, for sharing. I do have a question for you as well. Um, so it, as you were sharing your experiences, you, you talked about you know, um, being around uh, at the development of the UCA program, um, also being instrumental in getting a full-time Asian American Studies instructor and starting up the Asian American Faculty Staff Association. So um, were there, was there like, an, a, like maybe some sort of like an experience that happened or was there a, a reason why you were so like, you know, um, um, push, you were pushing so much for these, you know, Asian American centric, you know, things at our campus that was, was missing before? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think part of it might relate to my upbringing and my adoption. You know, I didn't really start to even identify as an Asian American, probably until um, late college. And Fresno City College kind of gave me the opportunity to grow into some of that thinking, right? Whether it's the students who I'm learning from and noticing where uh, their opportunities aren't at the college. In other words, you know, the Puente program, which was co-founded at the UC in 1981, thank goodness, serves Latinx students. Um, Fresno City College also had an Adelay program, but with the high number of Southeast Asian American students, Hmong American students and so forth, we became the first one in the state to serve our students with a program like the UCR program. And again, thanks to Debbie. Um, so it was part just realizing how important those opportunities were and noticing the gaps where there weren't uh, those programs in place. And, and then, and again, with the faculty and staff association, um, I think it's important for, for me, at least what I noticed is that other like-minded people and, and feeding off those energies and moving forward in a, in a common way. You know, one of the people who really came to me to talk about the need for a full-time Asian American studies instructor position, even though I was in the English department, right? I, I teach in the English department, was a person from social sciences named Kehende Solwazi who taught African-American studies. So there can be partnerships, of course, within a racial demographic, but it's very important to nourish and notice and foster those relationships that collectively move together people of color. So um, that along with some real fire, David, to get things done and, and um, that can be a long road. Um, 
but that kind of persistence and learning from senior faculty or supportive administrators where those exist, those can be very valuable um, things to learn from. So th those are some of the reasons I think maybe that fueled me, but um, yeah, just wanting to see things improve for those students. Thank you, Lee. Um, so Ku, same question to you. Uh, can you share with us your journey um, in to, uh, into the State Center Community College District and then how um, it has shaped you to be where you are today? So um, I've only been here actually four years. <laughs> so it's really nice to hear about Deborah's experience and Lee's experience. Um, so to start off with a little bit of history, um, I'm a child of refugees. Um, I was born in the United States um, in the Midwest, um, but my parents and the rest of my family came here as refugees from Laos. Um, and then they quickly moved to, to California right after. So I pretty much grew up in the Central Valley. So I didn't go very far, right? Um, my parents, um, I lucked out in that they were very supportive of, of me um, getting a college education. They just didn't expect me to stay in college forever, right? Because now here I am at Fresno City teaching. Um, so what happened was that, um, you know, after uh, getting college degree, I was at UC Merced finishing up um, with some of my graduate studies. Um, and the position actually opened up. It was towards the end of the, the uh, spring semester. And I just decided, hey, why not, right? You don't see political science um, positions open very often. And I knew that I did wanna stay in the Central Valley, um, specifically, um, if not in the Central Valley, then at least in California. And so um, when I got the call and they offered me the position, I was just like, wait, what? Did this just happen? I am so confused because you know, I didn't have a lot of teaching experience under my belt. I was teaching a direct democracy class at UC Merced, and I had been a TA. So I was very thankful that they took a chance on me. Um, and then so since then, um, I was also very lucky that the social science department at that time, when I came into it, they had also just started this kind of informal program that provided me with a faculty mentor. So Linda Vang was my faculty mentor. Um, she's in the sociology department, um, but oh, wow, that was um, so helpful for me. I mean, I asked her so many questions. We met almost weekly um, just, you know, because I had questions about what was going on, what I could do. And so she really served as this faculty mentor for my entire first year here. Um, and then subsequently after, um, even though I didn't meet with her as much, I would still text her um, and I would still um, email her. We would meet up occasionally. And so she's really served as um, um, somebody who's helped kind of shape me into the instructor that I am today because of her assistance, uh, not only because of that, but um, my department's um, um, helpfulness has kind of really shaped me into who I am. Um, so for instance, one of the things that um, I make sure to do now, especially since um, not only am I a you know, first generation college student, but English is also my second language. Um, I'm very open in the classroom. Um, I try to be um, less formal. So, you know, joking around in the classroom and stuff just to ensure that students are a lot, um, feel welcomed um, and that they feel like they can come to me with anything. Um, so that's kind of how my experience has been. And then um, as aside from the teaching, um, I also found a very welcoming environment at Fresno City. Um, a lot of that has to do with the foundation that, um, you know, Deborah and Lee have talked, they talked about, right? So these were these, um, they were the individuals who were here first and they kind of created this foundation so that when I came in for, you know, newbies like me, um, I would feel very welcome. So the AFS, um, AAFAS was one of the first, um, organizations that I joined and I found a lot of camaraderie there. So, you know, meeting Chai, meeting Lee, um, that really created this environment that now, even though, you know, when I first applied to Fresno City, I was like, sure, why not? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't want to go anywhere else, right? This is, I found my place. And I think that's one of the best things about um, my four years at SCCD. Thank you, Ku. And I, 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 you know, I share your same sentiment. I, I've been at Fresno City for I think like seven or eight years now. And, and same thing, like when I came in, like Asian American faculty staff, you see a program, they 
immediately reached out to me because I think it's almost like once they see um, that there's a new faculty member that is representative of their of the population that they want to you know advance like they they are really you know welcoming reaching out to to get you to to participate but to also learn um, from the students and learn from the other uh, faculty members um, yeah. so thank you for sharing with us all right Joseph so can you share with us your journey in in the state center community college district and how it shaped you to be where you are today Awesome. So I'll go ahead and start off by thanking everybody for inviting me. I know I'm a little stepchild from Ridley College, so I don't know all the faces here, but I've met some people uh, through the past couple of years uh, working at the district and uh, really appreciate all the interpreters and, and David, Lee, everybody being here helping out, Deborah, Q, uh, and Chai. So it's, it's awesome to see everybody and see a face and put a face and name at this point. And so my, my journey is, is kind of different. My, my route was, my dad was a first generation uh, college goer. And so he came here for his grad school. So he was uh, studying at the University of Missouri and I was uh, conceived here. So I was born in the United States. And due to some unforeseen circumstances, my mom and my dad had to go back home to Taiwan. So this is uh, overseas, a small little country island off of the uh, coast of China, not Thailand, but it's Taiwan. And we, uh, you know, after they moved back, I, I basically spent all of my K to 12 in Taiwan. So I, I had a really abrupt change in my environment and, and what I was used to. But during my high school years, I knew that I really hoped to come back for, for the higher education in the United States. And I read about it. I watched a lot of movies and, and friends and, and saw the life and the American dream. I really want to pursue that. So I ended up applying as an international student had to go through a lot of hurdles. And I eventually got into a school by the name of University of Washington in Seattle. And it was one of my top schools of my choices because they had a really great program. It's a big school, prestigious. And so that's how I, I started my higher education in the States. I came here uh, for four, uh, to Seattle for four and a half years. And after I graduated, I was perplexed. I was confused. I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Uh, but during those four years, I had several faculty that gave me an idea about pursuing science. And I started to lean towards uh, maybe research as an option of, of post, uh, post, post undergrad. So I applied to some schools and this was literally 2009. And as those that graduated in 2009 probably remember, it was the great recession and job opportunities was close to none. The housing market crashed, the stock market crashed, it was rough. And I ended up having to detour and say, well, let me just take a pause on, on my work and my career and finding a job. I'll just go back to school. So that was a safe choice. And I applied to several programs. And during that, uh, during that system, the, the, we had a quarter-based system. And so I graduated in the winter of 2009. And as some of the, the people in our room and students that are here with us might know that applications have different cycles. Some schools accept only in the fall and spring. And for me, I, I didn't want to wait a whole year. So I applied to some schools that were still open. And Fresno State was one of the programs that was still having rolling admissions for their grad program, their master's program in the biotechnology. And you know, it was great that they also had a tuition waiver for out-of-state students. So that to me was just telling me this is where I should go. And I made that decision based on a financial reason. I know there's a lot of reasons students choose schools, whether it be accessibility to professors or the vibe of the campus, the prestige or just family and, and word of mouth. So I, I, went, I went and rolled the dice with, with the uh, financial reason. And I have no family in Fresno. I've never been to California and I just drove from Seattle down. And I remember vividly as I was driving through getting gas, I, I asked uh, some of the gas clerks, say, hey, you know, what route, what highway do I take to get to Fresno? Am I on the right route? And then one clerk told me, why are you going to Fresno? There's nothing there. And I, I still remember that, that same saying, you know, from that day and, and ever, ever since I came to Fresno, I, I thought this is the greatest place. It's very friendly, a lot of great people. Um, I graduated after two, three years in the master's program doing research uh, under Dr. Yoon's office in the biology department. And eventually what happened that summer was, I had one of my, my good, uh, good friends uh, over there that, that was also in the lab recommended me to, to do a TA ship, you know, a teaching gig during that summer. And I, I never thought about teaching in my wildest dreams. This was not something that I ever thought I was hoping to do research. I, my dream job was to work for Pfizer. For those that know they are developing the vaccines, that was my dream job. But now I uh, had that summer opportunity to teach a class and I taught my first ever human anatomy course at Fresno State. And 
Little did I know they scheduled me for a three week class. So for those that know, summer classes are very challenging, but they crammed it down to the three week version of a course. And I felt like it was drowning. I felt I couldn't do this, but after the course ended, I gave it 100% effort every day. I studied with the students and I was up almost every single night uh, prepping, uh, writing exams, getting stuff graded on time. And the reviews were, were great. And after that, that opened the door to teaching. I eventually applied to teach part-time at the State Center Community College District. And I taught at Madeira for a semester. I also taught at Reed Lee. And I didn't get the ability to teach at Fresno City. I don't know, maybe that timing was, was not, um, you know, there was a, a fill of, of adjuncts or, or faculty or there wasn't a need for a staff there uh, to teach biology, but I did start at Ridley College and I, I just love the environment. It's so friendly. And after a year and a half of teaching adjunct, I applied for a full-time position and I got the full-time position. And this is, uh, fast forward another four or five years at Ridley College, I uh, got the chance to be the department chair, which I'm serving. And it is an interesting time to serve as a chair right now, to schedule classes, to address the faculty needs. And I will say, I feel like I got older a lot faster this year because of all the emails and all the, um, some of these uncertainty that we're living in. So that, that's where I, I came, kind of came from. And I'll probably share just two pieces of, of thought there to the students in the room or uh, people that, that, are, that are thinking about their journey and finding their passion is I believe in taking small steps. You know, whether, whether you try something, you go somewhere, go out of the city or out of the state for, for schooling, always try to tell yourself to take small steps and every day you should make some progress, something small. And, and as long as you're going towards a goal, eventually you'll, you'll get there. And the other thought, which resonates with, with Kao and also I, I definitely believe with what Lee said and, and Deborah said earlier is, is having that sense of community and, and helping each other. But that community sense is so important. It gives you value. And in my classes right now, and also in some of my research, I try to create that sense of belong where the students feel that you are excited, not just for the content and to learn from the instructor, but you, you wanna be there with each other because we're, we're all in this together. And during this pandemic, it's more important than ever because we're starting to lose that sense of how does it feel to be in a classroom, right? And, and I'm excited, hopefully, for next spring or next, next fall, when we do have the opportunity to be in a classroom, we have to relearn that, that rapport, that feeling of interaction with each other again. But that's what we all need. So that's, that's the condensed version of it, David. David, you're on mute. Wait, David, I think you're muted. I can't hear anything. So it's just, uh, it was just your story about, you know, the gas attendant telling you why, why you're going to Fresno. And then kind of like Deborah's story about, you know, Fresno having dirt roads, like, why would you want to go there? And then Lee never being here either, you know, and Cal coming, uh, Ku coming from like out of, out of the state, you know, it's just kind of funny how like, you know, every, all of you guys were just drawn into Fresno, right? Um, and it reminded me of like, you know, um, when I was, after I finished my graduate degree here at Fresno, in Fresno, I, I, I moved down to San Diego, I started a program down there, but then I started working there and I would always spend my vacation back in Fresno, right? And everybody would say, why are you going back to Fresno? You know, it was always something that was drawing back. Well, for me, it was my family that was drawing back, but eventually like I, I, I knew I wanted to be back in Fresno. Like I, I wanted to be near uh, the, my community of Hmong, uh, you know, where there's a larger Hmong community. Um, but I also wanted to be, um, you know, to contribute to the community that, that I grew up in, right? And I know like all four of you are not from this community, but, but then like you're now making this your community and then you're contributing to it as much as those of us that are, are originally from here. So I really appreciate, you know, you guys all not turning around <laughs> and leaving and uh, not, not contributing to uh, our, our local community here. Um, so second question that we're going to now. So we're going to go to Deborah. Um, what are some of the barriers or challenges in pursuing new roles or opportunities for, uh, for Asian Pacific Islander uh, faculty and administrators? Well, when I had an opportunity to apply for a vice president's job much earlier in my career, I thought about it and, I, and my children were fairly young at the time in elementary school and I didn't wanna be an hour's drive away in case they needed me. <laughs> it didn't even dawn on me. My husband works 10 minutes away from their elementary school. He could easily have picked them up, but it just 
at that time, I, I didn't even think that about him helping out. But ladies, this is a new day. You have partners, you have family, you have other people who can help. So when opportunities come up to apply uh, elsewhere in the district, think about it and, 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 and don't, don't count yourself out before you even apply. Uh, the other is that uh, when you see a, a job announcement, if as long as you meet the minimum quals, apply. Don't think you have to meet every one of the desirable qualifications because I'll tell you, there's been research done that show uh, people from underrepresented communities, if they don't have every single one of the desirable qualifications, they don't even apply. But Caucasians will apply even if they don't have any one of the desirable qualifications. So don't count yourself out. Don't knock yourself out of the competition before you even start. Apply. And, and that's what I would suggest. Great. Thank you, Deborah. And, you know, your first comment about, um, you know, like you not even thinking about your husband, you know, picking up the kids, it, I, I think it resonates with a lot of Asian Americans in how, uh, how women are perceived as, as like, uh, you know, the caretaker in, in the home, right? And so I think that that could be like another barrier, like, you know, kind of almost what you were, you were mentioning is like, you know, like, uh, you know, Asian American women, and particularly like from my experience, like among American women, like you know, traditionally they would grow up. They've been they're the home they're the they're the uh, home homemakers. They they care for the children, and even if they were working, that they would still be responsible for for the uh, care of the family at home. And so those could be like opportunity. Those could be like challenges that would inhibit um, inhibit you know uh, you know this population from pursuing you know, new roles and new opportunities, but I'm glad you said, Deborah, it's a new day, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna push everyone to be, you know, to the highest potential. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, so Lee, uh, what are some of the challenge, uh, barriers or challenges uh, that you see in pursuing new roles or opportunities for um, Asian Pacific Islander faculty and administrators? Yeah, so I have a few thoughts, you know, for people who might be, applying or those sorts of opportunities, but also I wanted to mention a few for folks already hired or somewhere along the tenure track or post tenure. Um, so obstacles, I think for some, for some Asian American or a API folks, um, I think whether it's cultural or familial or uh, whatever the reason, you know, this collective cultural, uh, moving together thing, which is um, essential and important and good. I think it can complicate it for a person applying for jobs because as somebody told me once when I was uh, applying, a job interview is not the time to be modest. Um, that's not to say we're the greatest person ever. I mean, I'm not teacher of the month here, right? But I am not going to shy away from telling a committee of six or eight people who are investing a lot of money and you know, so forth into a position. Um, I, I'm gonna try to tell them why I'm, I'm the person and what I've done. So I think just being comfortable with your accomplishments and what you can contribute. It's meaningful. Uh, we don't have to be apologetic for it. Um, we're as qualified, we're not lucky to have a job. I mean, in some sense, I, I suppose we are, but we have the same degrees, we have experience, we went through the same process. And so I think as, as applicants build those experiences and uh, learn to network and establish good rapport and um, things like that. Also um, related to this, something I'd really strongly encourage people who are applying really for any job even if it's a promotion or an advancement, but definitely a tenure track teaching job or counseling job, I can't stress this enough, is to talk to senior faculty or counselors who have been on hiring committees. And I see Joseph, Ku, and David all nodding. Here's why I say that, and they know it, but sometimes people still looking for jobs don't, is that everybody who applies is qualified or everybody who gets an interview is qualified. You're not going to get an interview if you don't have a degree and even a little bit of teaching experience, most likely. 
But that interview experience counts for a lot. And if we're only talking to people who also have never been on the search committees or the hiring committees, it's, it's hard to know um, some of the things that can really be helpful for a person, how, how to do well in those interviews. So I'm available if anybody wants to, to talk, but seek out people who you think are supportive in senior positions. Um, so those are a couple of things I wanted to mention, um, sort of pre, pre-position or pre-tenure track. As far as obstacles and barriers um, in, in other ways, one thing I wanted to mention given the focus of this panel or, or, or the month or acknowledging Asian American um, experiences is that, uh, you know, I should say that I've had amazing colleagues and I've been fortunate to work with some incredible folks. Um, but there's also been a lot of racism. There have been uh, a lot of microaggressions and a lot of erasure. And this isn't to be negative, but it's to be realistic. I think it would be, <laughs> well, I dare say naive to say that that's absent in academia where it's pervasive in every other aspect of society. So, you know, here's an, one example is uh, a, a white colleague who once told me as I asked, for, we needed to use the conference room for an Asian American faculty and staff association meeting. And he, in his mind, he was joking, but he kind of made a, a fake Asian accent and bowed at me and said, you know, oh, Lee, so sorry, I did not know. And I was infuriated. And uh, I've since developed a quick comeback or a way to speak to that. You know, when I was maybe 18, I would just think it was a joke and laugh it off because I was nervous and humiliated. But I walked sort of out of the room after him and looked him in the eyes and said, do not ever say that to me again. You are a racist. Do not speak to me like that. And he was kind of taken aback. So I think in whatever way we need to, uh, that's an example, maybe an egregious example of, of direct racism. Other examples, as far as barriers and obstacles are just acts of erasure and silence and microaggressions in committee meetings. And it, I didn't even probably realize this for my first four, six, seven, eight years. You know, it, it takes a while to notice things, I think, at least it did for me. But I can be in a room now and notice when one colleague makes a comment such as this, which I've heard in the English department, Hmong students' names are so hard to pronounce. That's one person who teaches 100 students every semester, shapes curriculum, but is othering student names. And I said to the person in the meeting, I said, do you mean like her? Is that, <laughs> is that hard to pronounce? Or, you know, so, um, and I have good relationships with my colleagues. I'm not looking to always um, stir the pot, but I notice when racism exists and microaggressions exist, and th those have implications at our college. They, they have um, direct impact on our students, uh, whether it's who's hired, who's not hired, um, what programs are, are supported and what aren't. So those are some of the barriers, I think the erasure, the racism, um, but also just a, a person's hesitance to be comfortable in whatever ways you are comfortable advocating for yourself. We're all different. But I think however we do it, I, I think it's an important thing to do. Great, thank you, Lee. Uh, so Ku, what are some barriers or challenges uh, that you see in pursuing new roles or opportunities for um, API faculty and administrators? Um, so this kind of piggybacks on what Deborah and Lee talked about in terms of advocating for ourselves. Um, and of course, this is more kind of personal to me, right? Um, but maybe, um, and you kind of spoke about it earlier too, um, that maybe it might be something that is more co common among um, communities where the collective is an important unit. Um, so one of the things is definitely you need to advocate for yourself. 
Um, one of the things I found and I've tried to kind of stop doing as well is I often talk about um, accomplishments in terms of a we, um, because I always wanna make sure that whoever um, assisted or whoever was there along the way also gets credit. But I also, then I forget that, you know, I did something too. Um, and so I think that's very important in a society where um, individualism is often, um, is often um, um, the more of the unit that's emphasized that you also remember that, hey, you know, you contributed to things as well. Um, and Lee touched on this um, about, I think, you know, the idea of being humble. Um, yes, it's great to be humble, but, you know, when it's time to go for um, an, an interview, you need to kind of highlight all these awesome things that you did because you are an awesome individual. Um, and I think that for me, that's what's been hard. Um, so if anybody can kind of take away from kind of the things that I, you know, about my own experiences, you know, be able to advocate for yourself, um, recognize that you, you know, contributed to these different things and without your contribution, things might've been different. So recognize that. Um, and the other thing is then to, you know, just be comfortable in your own skin. Um, I think that was really important, um, especially when, um, you know, going for the interview, um, it was funny because I was actually up against one of my other colleagues. Um, and so you have to remember, you know, like as much as they have something to offer, you, you know, you have something to offer as well. Um, and then for my own experience is just this idea about familial obligations. Um, so it's it's kind of difficult because you have to think, you know, if I want to go for a certain position, I have to think about the family unit as well. Um, but as both of um, um, Deborah and you have said, you know, it's a new day, like be able to um, think about the different things that can be done to ensure that you're able to also um, go for these positions. So that's just been kind of my personal experience and more individual um, as opposed to um, institutional remedies. All right, great. Thank you, Ku. And Joseph, uh, what have you seen as barriers or challenges for pursuing new roles um, for Asian, Asian and Pacific Islander uh, faculty and administrators? Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Uh, it's always hard to follow uh, everybody, uh, Deborah, Lee, and, and, and Ku. So uh, real quick is I, I think part of the, uh, the way that I see obstacles is just resonating off of everybody's thoughts there is number one, you need to be authentic. Uh, authentic, you know, authenticity is a big deal is trying to be yourself, being comfortable, being expressive. For myself, the biggest trouble I had is I grew up for most of my education overseas. And as a lot of folks might know, there's a very big clash between Eastern and Western education systems. And a lot of our parents, if they're first generation, they've had some exposure of education overseas or, or back in uh, Laos, Cambodia, China, wherever it may be. And the education system over there is very top down. So we're ingrained I would say not at the DNA level, but I would say down to our cultural part where it's a top-down authority. And a lot of times when you are a new faculty or you're a new graduate trying to get a job, you tend to, to follow and fit into that role as that model uh, minority, right? As, as Asian Americans in this country is that we are quiet, we're, we're silent, we don't really talk too much, we just go with the flow. But one one piece that I do think Lee hit, hit the cord on is just be loud. Sometimes you do need to be loud, you need to be vocal and trust that your background, your expertise has a place in, in what you can contribute to the department or to the meeting. Uh, for me, I've been finding myself over these past few years as I step into the role of department chair, uh, very challenging because I, I go into these meetings with a lot of the deans and vice presidents and, and I feel that sometimes my voice isn't important. And, and there are times where I'll, I'll think, I'll listen to what's been going on and of course take notes and learn and to contribute when I can. So I think part of the, the issue is just being vocal when needed, but of course it comes at the cost of, of being also a good listener as well. So find a balance is what I would recommend doing. And one other piece I also really felt strongly with what Deborah said is just being able to apply, right? Just go for it. You can't, you can't really can't have anything to lose unless you try. And the more you do that, the more you apply to a program, the more you apply to a job, the higher the chances. I remember I had a student that wanted to go to medical school and he was so determined that he applied to almost every single school in the college and spent $5,000 just on applications. And he, he got in to one or a few of them, but he was so determined where most people might just say, I'll apply to five or six schools. And if it doesn't, if I don't get accepted, my dreams close and I go another route. So it's, it comes down to determination and what you want to be 
and of course, being aware of your surroundings, right? And, and I really don't want to just celebrate everybody in here, you know, breaking that, that bamboo ceiling or the glass ceiling that we hear about, um, where, you know, De Deborah, for sure, you know, you're, you're cracking it for us, Deborah. So appreciate that. All right. Thank you, Joseph. And we're down to our last question. Um, and uh, some of you have already touched on, on a little bit of this too, but I hope that um, you guys can add to this. So, um, so this last question, uh, first to you, Deborah, um, what advice would you give to others who want to set off in a similar direction in the community college? Well, when you're offered an opportunity to take on addition, an additional assignment, you should take it on because you'll learn a lot from it and you'll demonstrate to others that you're willing and have a desire to work hard. And when you finish that assignment, ask your boss if there's anything else that needs to be done, an initiative or a drive or something. <laughs> like I said, I learned that when I was a little kid. If you want to advance the highest levels in community college administration, you have to get your doctorate now. At the time I, I had finished my qualifying exam, I was enrolled in the Fresno State Joint Doctoral Program with, with UC Davis. I'd taken the qualifying exam, I'd started on my dissertation, and they made me president of Clovis Community College. So I thought, well, I don't have time anymore. And I stopped uh, pursuing that. That was a big mistake because it really limits what you can do without your doctorate. Uh, and if I had to do it over again, I would have gotten my doctorate much earlier in my career. And right now there are so many online doctoral programs, even in the CSU system. Fresno State has a program that's designed for working professionals that you can sign up for. Or I know there's one um, at one of the CSUs down south that's totally online, except for some residential uh, work you do in the summer, like a couple, two, three weeks. So it's very doable for, for folks now. And I would encourage you, if you want to go higher up into administration in the community college system, get your doctorate and get it early. Don't wait as long as I did. The funny thing now is uh, everyone in my family has a doctorate. My, my daughter has a Juris doctorate. My other daughter has a PharmD. My husband's a Juris doctorate. And I'm the educator. I'm the only one without the doctorate. So, so get it done and get it done early. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that advice, Deborah. So Lee, same to you. What advice would you have for others who want to set off in a similar direction um, in the community college? Um, yeah, so... One, one thing I would say relates to what Debbie said, um, and that is to uh, build out your CV and experience as much as you can. Um, I know it's difficult often as an adjunct for a number of reasons, travel, different campuses, no compensation and so forth. But it's, it's beyond just putting on a CV that might help you get the interview that you are familiar with this committee's work. It's that through that experience, you'll know more about what we do. So that in the interview, you'll be able to speak about that sort of work or that policy or that curriculum change or that pedagogical decision to be a more appealing and, and ready to go candidate. Um, so, uh, build out your experience as much as you can. Um, another thing I would say is to, uh, if you can, and I already mentioned this, is just to, to talk to people who've been there and done it, people you trust and that you are pretty sure have your best interests in mind. It's not just what you ask, it's who you're asking. If you're asking someone who's neutral towards you or even worse, not going to advocate for you, their answers might be just that, neutral and not very helpful. So it's important to know who you're asking. And the third thing I would say only applies to people who may be mobile or flexible in where they can apply. I hear a lot of people uh, at colleges I taught at in Northern California and many here in Fresno, if they say, I need to teach only at Fresno City or Reedley or Clovis, because of this reason, family or whatnot, that's legitimate in my mind, right? And that's a good reason. But I hear this a lot. I really just love Fresno City and I, and I want to be in a diverse setting. 
Now to that, I would only say, I, I love it too. It's the greatest joy, right? And, um, but if that's the reason you're not applying out, there are many colleges that are diverse. I, I would never have applied to Fresno City if I had only wanted to stay in Modesto. So um, that's what I would say. And, and often adjuncts or people who are applying, I think have such great uh, experiences that I know if there was another college that saw that they would get an interview and maybe probably get that job. So in other words, don't limit yourself. You, you might be surprised about what amazing opportunities are out there. But again, that's, um, if unfortunately you can't get on here somewhere, um, have some faith, perseverance, and um, and good things will happen. Great, thank you, Lee. So, Ku, what about you? What advice would you have for those that want to set off in uh, in the similar direction in community college? So, um, I want to take just a one step back, right? So, when you start applying, especially when you're in grad school, I think community colleges aren't really on the mind of a lot of the faculty. A lot of the times you're really trained for research. Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons why Fresno City had not initially been on my radar because I was like, research, research, I wanna do research and I still love research. But the other thing is you have to also figure out like, what do you wanna do? Is it that you only wanna do research or is it that you love teaching? Because at the end of the day, a community college is all about teaching, right? So we don't really have, um, as faculty, um, and I might be wrong in diff uh, about different departments, but you all can let me know. But um, at least you know, with poli sci, you know, I don't have this um, push that I need to publish. I need to do research because it's all about you know my students, and it's all about teaching. So I think that's one of the important things to decide if you want to, you know, work at a community college is, you know, is teaching important to you? Um, is, you know, um, advising students, is that important to you? If that's the case, then the community college is definitely one route that you can, um, you can take. Um, the other thing that um, is helpful is, um, and this is again something that Lee already touched on, is like you speak to your colleagues, um, especially community college colleagues, um, because they can tell you what it's like. You can try to um, see if the environment is something that, you, that you'd be comfortable with. Um, then the other thing is if you know anybody, um, especially um, students who are, at the, um, who are taking community college classes, who, who are currently in community college, um, I think that they're a great resource because then from you can get from their perspective what their expectations of their um, um, their professors, their instructors are, right? Because as, as um, faculty, we have our expectations. We say like, I, I, you know, I love political science, so I wanna impart all this stuff about the government to you. But from a student's perspective, they might be like, I'm just trying to pass a class, or I just really need an instructor who is understanding, who, you know, understands my life experiences and um, can kind of, you know, um, identify with me on certain things if I have trouble anything that they can um, reach out to me. And so I think that's really important to get the student perspective as well as um, the perspective of faculty. Um, and, and the other thing is, um, as Lee already mentioned, you know, build out your CV, do all these other things to, to really, um, you know, make sure that you get that, um, that interview, right? Make sure that you're able to apply. Great, thank you, Koo. And Joseph, so what advice would you have for um, those that are wanting to set off in this similar direction in the community college? I'll speak from a bio, uh, science perspective or science faculty perspective. I know in sciences and chemistry and biology, a lot of folks take pride in what they, what they study and their expertise. So I think for faculty going into science teaching, one of the big uh, tips here would be just to, instead of doing and being a jack of all traits, focus on one course and focus expertise on that. It gives you a niche when you apply to a job. And so you can shine there and what separates you from the other competitors or applicants. And for me, when I started teaching at Fresno State, my first assignment, that three week summer course was a human anatomy course. So for those that know, in our district, we have so many aspiring nurse students. My past six, five, six years of teaching in the Valley has always been, I wanna be nurse, I wanna be nursing, I wanna do PA, PT. And so the human anatomy physiology was my, my niche that I carved into to that opportunity. It was hard, it was challenging. It took a lot of prep and it was one of those classes that 
other instructors will feel, hey, you know, if I have the same amount of energy, same amount of credit and contract, why, why would I teach a more challenging course and, and take up more workload? So going back to what everybody said is, is be willing to do more and of course take a, a less travel path. Um, one of the, the big, uh, I guess, motivations that I get is, is a guy called Joe Rogan, his podcasts, and he always says to take a dangerous path, not literally, but take something that is risky, that has bigger rewards. And I recommend doing that. And then the last part is if you are already applying for jobs, always make sure to improve yourself. If you apply to a job and you get denied, come back to the drawing board and say, what can I do? Can I take another course? Can I do another uh, service, teach another course, take another course, however you want to improve so that when you apply the next time around, you have a fuller package and a fuller uh, resume. And at some point you will outcompete other people. It might take more time, but that will happen. So that's, that's my uh, tips for folks going into uh, job hunting and applications. Great, thank you. Appreciate hearing all of those, um, those advice, you know, like uh, it kind of brings me back to when I was applying as well. I'm kind of thinking, yeah, you know, I would have definitely benefited from a lot of these uh, advice that uh, you guys have been sharing. So I hope that our, um, I hope that our, um, our attendees here, especially those that are, you know, uh, students that are looking towards um, a career in, in this field, in this area um, of community college that, you know, you take, you take heart um, of what the advice has been shared uh, with us today um, and, um, and use it to your best, you know, ability to improve your status and improve your ability to, to be in positions to, um, to take on these roles and, um, and, and responsibilities. Um, so we do have a couple of questions on the uh, Q&A, um, and I'll open it up to whoever wants to respond. Um, Christine Phillips asked um, that she wants to know what the panelists think um, that the State Center Community College can do to make, uh, to make uh, our colleges and our district a safer and more welcoming place for staff and students. Um, and so, and that kind of, dovetails into what John's uh, question is, or his cons his comment slash question is that he wants to hear what you guys feel or what your thoughts or feelings are regarding the uh, anti-Asian violence that is kind of incur occurring in our country. So these two kind of like questions kind of fall in line together as well. So um, I'll open it up to anyone, uh, anyone that wants to chime in. And for those of you guys that are uh, have questions, again, please type them into the Q&A box. Oh, well, I can tell you the board uh, recently passed an anti-Asian hate resolution. So at the board level, you know, as I said, I try to stick at the policy level and not try to get into the management of the colleges and the district. But I did take uh, the anti-Asian. I belong to APITA, which is the Asian Pacific Islander Trustee uh, and uh, Administrator Association for the California Community College uh, League, which is um, the trustee and CEO organization, but it also includes other administrators in the California Community Colleges. And when the anti-Asian, the history of anti-Asian violence isn't just recent, it goes back um, many, many, many years, you know, to, to uh, um, the uh, immigration or the halt of Chinese, the Chinese Exclusion Act, the, the uh, inability for Asians, uh, Japanese and Chinese to buy land uh, if they were immigrants to the incarceration of Japanese Americans. And anyway, it's, but more recently, these, these more current issues that are going on were really propagated by our president at the time, who himself I believe to be a racist, and that may not be politically correct, but I, I believe that to be true. And so it's really up to all of us to, to get out there and educate the population on the rich culture and, and the contributions we have made to the United States, which are significant. Many of the um, um, current vaccines that have been developed have been done by Asian, Amer by Asian Americans. So um, we have contributed a lot to the society and, and we need to fight against anti-Asian violence in, in every way we can. And we need to make our students and staff feel comfortable and safe on our campuses in, in every way that we can. And, and for students, I believe it's finding a place for, for them, uh, for them to believe that they're safe on our campus, that we welcome them here, 
and that we do everything we can to make sure they feel welcomed. And one of the things I tried to do at Clovis Community College was to make sure our, sta our staff welcomed people to our campus. So whenever they saw someone wandering around campus, uh, we were all encouraged to ask, can I help you? Is there anything you need? If, particularly if you see them looking around like they don't know where they're going. So you want to be a welcoming campus and, and you want to do that for everybody. But this issue of anti-Asian violence has been very concerning. And, and uh, locally, I belong to the uh, Japanese American Citizens League, which is a civil rights organization. And we have been working with um, um, Congressman Costa and the mayor on finding ways that we can combat this whole issue. And, and, and the mayor is thinking about setting up uh, an anti-Asian uh, uh, person responsible for handling those complaints. So things are happening. Great, thank you, Deborah. I appreciate um, all the work that you're doing in your leadership role and um, in our community and helping combat this. Um, anybody else would like to chime in on this, these questions? Yeah. Um, I, I was so happy to see the chancellor's statement and Dr. Goldsmith's statement. That's something I think that has not always been the case in my 25 years at the college is a proactive, vocal, firm statement against those sorts of things. Um, in the past, it's been reactive if it happened at all. So I was very happy to see the district's um, statement. It, it has meaning especially if it goes beyond the statement. To Debbie's point that it has to go beyond um, that, uh, if the colleges, if the division deans, and especially the faculty remain silent, then it just remains a statement at the top, right? So one thing, um, I won't say too much yet, but this will be forthcoming out of uh, my department, um, is something specific to anti-Asian hate. Um, I think we need to be able to say it, even though we may have that feeling, I'm the only Asian in the room and I'm gonna have to be the one to say this again. At least for me, I always felt that burden because right now we're all Asian or most of us on, in this room and all on the panel. But when we go back to our departments, again, we're 4% of the faculty, staff, and administration at the college, 4%. So what I would say is we have to say something, but also other people need to say something. Other non-Asian people need to speak out and say, um, time out, or this needs to stop, or have we thought about including this? Because uh, it, takes, it takes everyone. Uh, case in point, I saw a description, a job description change go out recently, a couple of years ago, and it said there was some new language about familiarity with Native American, Latinx, Black populations, and Asian American wasn't on there. And I thought, how many people and committees did that have to pass to be implemented? And I said, can we, you know, we, we have to continually advocate, but again, I think it's important that other people uh, push back against that kind of hate and erasure as well. Great, thank you, Lee. Joseph or Ku, do you guys have anything to add on to this? Um, so just, I mean, really to reiterate, um, I, I'm just doing a lot of reiterations, but it's true, right? With what Debbie, um, Deborah and Lee have, have talked about is advocating, um, making sure that if something happens, you see something happens that you speak out about it. Um, and I know it can be a little bit scary at first, but you know, you don't wanna fall victim to the bystander effect um, thinking that, oh, if, uh, if I don't say something, maybe somebody else will already do it. But you have to um, think that, that maybe someone else isn't, so you have to be the one to do it. Um, the other thing I wanted to also say was um, really, um, so not only to advocate, but be a listener, right? So, I mean, if other people are telling you their experiences, like validate that because, you know, maybe your experiences might be different, but you want to make sure that, you know, they're being heard. Um, and if you are the voice, if you, you know, have, um, um, you, if you have the capabilities that these individuals don't, then you should advocate for them as well. Um, and I think that's really, um, really important. Okay, thank you, Ku. I'll just add real quick a minute. Um, we're going to the order of presentation, so I figure I just go with the flow. 
Uh, I think one of the best things that Aretha College is doing right now is, is our president and the leadership there has been opening up to having dialogues and just being honest about how the message comes out. Uh, Dr. Buckley uh, really championed this for us too. He, he had a group of us on a committee look at a message that was going to be sent out to everybody. And a lot of eyes, including myself, was able to look at the message, feel comfortable with it, sending it out. But I, I really think that a lot of dialogue is great, but a lot of times action is also needed too. So we plan, we talk, but the other side is putting that into action. And that's the work that sometimes needs to be done. Great, thank you. Um, and Deborah, we have a question here uh, directed towards you. Um, it says that, um, what is the uh, district going, uh, doing to increase the um, uh, Asian Pacific Islander faculty and staff? Okay, I saw Sam Campbell was on this uh, in the audience. She, she might be able to address that. But what I can say is that as a board, we have, we're involved in something called the Trustee Fellowship Program. And uh, we are working to develop a project uh, that will, we, we know all the campuses are working on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies now. But as a trustee, we want to take a look at the data. For example, for uh, screening committees, we went to look at the number of applicants and look at the diversity of that applicant pool. And then we want to look at how many of those applicants made it to the, uh, uh, the pool to be reviewed for interview and, and what the diversity of that was. And then we want to look at how many made it to the interview and what the diversity of that was. We want to look at the diversity of the screening committee itself and, and track that. So all this data is, um, we wanna look at it as a board and we wanna compare it year to year to see, oh, and we wanna of course look at the final outcome to see if that diversity has uh, improved within the staff, uh, faculty and administrative ranks. Um, and al although I'm interested in Asian Americans, I'm interested in all underrepresented hires to tell you the truth because we're underrepresented in every ethnic category when it comes to our faculty, staff, and administrative ranks. So we need to do a better job. Our HR people are working on that. This, this, there is a statewide diversity, equity, and inclusion implementation committee through the chancellor's office. As I said, I was working on one of those committees, but um, ACRO, which is the Association of HR Professionals in the community colleges, working with the academic senate, the CIOs, the CSSOs, has come up with several recommendations on how we can improve diversity in our, in our staff, faculty, and administrative ranks. And they're being pushed out to the colleges and districts to take a look at and to implement. And, and the statewide academic senate is involved with this. And they have also agreed and come out with their own recommendations. So if you go to the statewide academic senate uh, website, you can see the recommendations they have made uh, to increase diversity. We have to do more though than push out paper and push out recommendations. We have to implement. And that's where we're at now, the implementation of these strategies, and then the final result to see that uh, these improvements uh, in hiring have been made. And we, as a board, hold our chancellor responsible for that. And that gets tied into his evaluation process. He, in turn, holds the CEO responsible, the presidents. The presidents, in turn, hold the deans. The deans, in turn, hold department chairs. So everybody has to be held accountable to improving um, uh, the diversity ranks in, within our, our faculty, staff, and administration because our students really um, feel much more comfortable when they're, uh, they have people that they can go to that look like them, that have the same background that they have. And, and the other thing we're looking at is disaggregating data. So for Asian population, if you just look at the Asian data, for the State Center Community College District. It looks like we're doing fine. It looks like all of our students are doing fine. But when you start disaggregating the Asian data and look at Southeast Asians pulled away from Chinese, Japanese, and other groups that have been here much longer, you see that they need additional assistance and we need to funnel money to, to, to work like UCI and, and other groups to make, ensure that those students are getting the resources they need to, to, to improve their success rates. So as a board member, my role is to really hold uh, our chancellor accountable for that by looking at the data 
on a regular basis. And that's what this trustee fellowship program is to get all of the board members on the same page and to hold our administration responsible for improving um, the diversity within our, our uh, ranks. So, so that's what uh, the district is doing. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you, Deborah. Um, so Ku, you had something you wanted to add? Oh, so I just wanted to add that, you know, as faculty members, I think one of the things we sometimes can forget is that we have a platform, right? We have our classroom. And something that's really important to ensure diversity is to ensure that the readings that we have our students do are diverse in itself. Um, I'm, you know, going to, you know, growing up taking classes, like a lot of my readings were done by, you know, someone other than uh, who looked like me. So I think that's something really important that we can, you know, something little that we can do to start taking steps into creating um, diversity um, amongst, you know, our students. Okay. Yeah, can I, can I echo that a minute, David? Um, okay. Yeah, of course our own. And also if you're in a department just to be mindful of those discussions as well. In the English department, we're currently revising our English 1A course outline. I'm not on the committee, but I did receive the uh, draft and the recommended texts were probably seven or eight and there wasn't a single author or editor of color. And so again, I just said, could we consider that as we revise this? Um, but one thing I wanted to just also mention about um, to, to the question, I think about uh, increasing the percentage and the representation, I'm, I'm glad and I'm uh, hopeful about all the good work that the board is doing, but just something for those of us in departments, one thing that happens is the erasure or the dissolution of the existing representation. Case in point, I hope that Fresno City College, when the current instructor for Asian American studies retires, and he's been open about that, and I think he will be a great loss, but I hope the position is not lost. Those are very competitive. A lot of people want growth positions or replace, but that position should be replaced. Also, the UCI program should have a full 100% full-time counselor. When we created that, Debbie was there, we argued, we, we got that. It was 100%, but over the years it gets watered down and now it's just, I believe 50%. So keeping the positions that are intact is important to lobby for those things as well around the college and especially within your department. I would like to echo that. Um, I think it's very important to maintain the Asian American studies full-time faculty member at Fresno City. And, and uh, I, I, I wanna make sure my uh, views are known as well. Uh, Cal State University passed a, a, a regulation requiring ethnic studies be offered as part of the general ed pattern and a requirement that it must be taken. The community colleges are in the process of doing the same thing. I would hope that the colleges look at offering Asian American study, you do it at Fresno City, but not all the colleges do, offering an Asian American studies at every one of our colleges. So our students had the opportunity and other students had the opportunity to take that class. I think it's very important that, I mean, we're only asking for one ethnic studies class to be taken as a requirement. Uh, I think it's very important, particularly in this day and time that every student be exposed to some other culture than their own. Yeah. Great, thank you. And um, and again, I'd like to thank all of you for, um, for sharing with us your, your journey, your experiences, your stories, um, and we're, we're like right at the end of this. And so um, again, a big thank you to our attendees for joining us. Um, and if you, for those of you guys that are attending that you'd like to learn more about employing opportunities at the State Center Community College District, you would like to have, get more information from our panelists or about our panelists, um, you can contact uh, Chai Hurd, the Asian American Faculty Staff Association President. Um, Chai, I think she's gonna drop her email in, her, in the chat pretty soon. And so again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you uh, to all of our, uh, our panelists and our participants. Um, and um, hopefully um, you learned a lot. I learned a lot, you know, even being as a faculty at Fulton City for a number of years now, I still, I'm still learning a lot from you guys and I'm looking forward to, to, um, to hearing more from all of you as, uh, as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks everybody. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.
Hi, nice seeing y'all, all of you. Thanks, you too. Good to see you, you Debbie. Too. Take you care, too. everybody. Bye now.